everybody and welcome to True Indigenous Crime Tuesday, which means welcome to a brand new episode of One Missing, One Murdered, All Indigenous. And for my new listeners, One Missing, One Murdered, All Indigenous is a true crime podcast dedicated to true crime involving indigenous people. I'm your host, Jordan Lone Bear. And at the top of the show, I want to give a huge shout out to Rainice Ridley for providing us with that beautiful song that has become the theme song for One Missing, One Murdered, All Indigenous. I also want to welcome everybody that checked us out on YouTube, Podbean, Spotify, and Google Play, or if you're coming from the Facebook or from our sister podcast, Scary Stories to Tell from the Res. I want to welcome you all because it's your support that has kept me going and keeps this podcast going. So I want to say thank you to everybody. Now, with that being said, I want to welcome everybody into the Twisted Bear Studio, provided to us by our beautiful sponsor, the Twisted Bear Boutique. Now, the Twisted Bear Boutique actually offers its customers a wide selection of clothing from over 600 product lines. Now, they're excited to announce that they've opened a brand new warehouse in Los Angeles that they've stocked with private LA designer labels. So you can always count on exclusive designer brands at reasonable prices. So I encourage you to go check them out and shop with them at TwistedBearBoutique.com. You can also keep up to date with all of the new inventory that they drop weekly along with great deals that you don't want to miss by finding them on all of their social medias, including Facebook, Instagram, TikTok, and many more. You can also scan the QR code that I've got sitting up right now that should take you straight to the website so you can start shopping today. And for listeners of One Missing, One Murdered, All Indigenous, simply type in the promo code One Missing, One Murdered, that's One Missing, One Murdered, all caps, at checkout for 10% off of your first purchase. Remember to always be bold, edgy, authentic, and radiant. But most importantly, let Twisted Bear Boutique help you bring out your inner bear. That's B-E-A-R. Now that we've got our sponsors out of the way, I want to talk a little bit about the cases that I've chosen today because coming up right around the corner is the MMIW Awareness Day, which is on May 5th, which we'll actually be doing something special for on that day, but I don't want to give it away at the top of the hour just yet, even though I've put it out there on my social medias. I've specifically chosen two cases today that I haven't even heard of. These are cases that have really fallen between the cracks and have been overlooked not only by the public, but by law enforcement and social media awareness and everything like that. These cases filled me with a lot of questions. With such little information, both cases left me with more questions than there was answers. So with that being said, let's kick the show off by talking about our first case of the day. Let's talk about the unsolved disappearance of Christine Lester. Now, Christine Lester was a 24-year-old indigenous woman from Indian Wells, Arizona. Christine was also a member of the Navajo Nation. Now, on May 5th of 1987, having just cashed a check and having $300, she actually set her sights on Flagstaff, Arizona to head to the mall. At around 6 a.m. that morning, Christine actually told her grandmother that she had plans to meet up with a friend so they could both go to the mall in Flagstaff. Now, it's not really clear as to how Christine was going to make it to Flagstaff. Because there's so many different reports that Christine told her grandma that she and her friend intended on hitchhiking and other reports saying that she planned on catching a greyhound to Flagstaff. So just like I was saying that it's really hard to gather as much information when there is a limited supply. You can only report and talk about either one or the other in this case. So I figure telling both sides might give everybody a clearer picture as to what happened. Now, the last reports of anyone seeing Christine alive would be when she caught a ride to Arizona Highway 77, which was about a two-mile trip in her uncle's truck. Upon arriving at the highway, Christine actually got out onto the road, and that is where it's last said seeing Christine, period. I mean, it's almost as if she vanished into thin air. Now, because there aren't a lot of details, like I was saying, about her disappearance, I can't really say how long or even who reported her missing. And since she went missing after taking a ride in her uncle's truck, a lot of questions come to my head. One of the questions has to do with who was actually driving the truck if it wasn't her uncle and if any of them were ever questioned. And another question that I had was, you know, why couldn't the truck actually take her to Flagstaff by themselves or even to the nearest Greyhound bus? And to touch on the Greyhound bus thing, I want to know if there's any record of her even catching a a greyhound or anything like that or if she's ever been spotted near a greyhound or anything like that. And with her wanting to catch a greyhound to Flagstaff, I want to know actually what her plan was to get home as well. If she was going to take the greyhound or if she had arranged a ride 
from the person that took her to the highway. Like I said, a lot of questions that just make me really wonder what was going on. Now, following her disappearance, the woman that Christine told her grandmother she was supposed to meet up for the trip to Flagstaff actually came out and denied having any plans to meet up with Christine or even talking to her at all that day of or even the day before. And like I said, with such limited information, I want to know who this person was. I mean, was she was she really a friend of Christine's or did Christine just simply use her name? Did she make her up? It doesn't make much sense to lie about her friend to her grandmother unless she was trying to sway it or avoid suspicion in some way. But I don't want to ponder too much on that. Now, one thing to note about Christine was that she actually suffered from epilepsy. She actually did have prescription medication that she took, but the odd thing was, the day that she was going to make her journey to Flagstaff, she actually left her medication behind. Now, you can say that it maybe have been an oversight and that she forgot her medication, but again, with not a lot of information, like how often she needed to take her medication, I mean, could she not have needed it for that long, at least giving her time to go do her errands and shopping so that way she could take it when she got home? And if that was the case, then that would probably mean that she had some plan of coming back home. But again, we'll never know what Christine was thinking or what was going on in her head at the time. Now, Christine's family would actually go on to say that she wasn't the type to take off. She was actually described by her sister-in-law, Marjorie Lester, as a shy, religious person who rarely left home. I mean, all of us that have survived this pandemic, this COVID pandemic, know exactly what that's like to be a hermit and not want to leave your home. So you got to wonder if maybe she was dealing with some cabin fever and need just needed to get out of the house or just needed to just get some air and some socialization. But again, another thing that, but again, another question that I have is what was Christine's home life like? I know that she was living with her grandmother at the time, but there hasn't been a lot of talk about what her home life was like. If maybe she, she could have run away from a bad situation in her life or something like that. But again, I, I don't want to ponder or speculate too much on the negative. Now, a news article that was published by the Arizona Republic on September 20th of 1987, just a little over five months since Christine was last seen, accounts all of the activity that actually happened at that time. Now, I'd actually like to go through the entire article with you, and we can read along as they come up on the screen here. So like I said, this was a snippet from the Arizona Republic newspaper. Now, it looks like it was probably put on page one or two because it's continued. So we can just pick up from where it left off. Had been in a very happy mood. A long-awaited Social Security check of $300 had just been cashed, and it was time to take the 120-mile journey for shopping at Flagstaff Mall. So right there, it identifies exactly what check Christine had, which would have been the Social Security check. The 24-year-old woman told her grandmother with whom she was living with in an aging house near Vidahachi Trading Post, sorry if I butchered that, that she was going to meet a friend that the two would hitchhike to Flagstaff. So that's the first account that Christine had intended on hitchhiking to Flagstaff. And like I said earlier in the article, that's a 120-mile journey just to be walking or hitchhiking. Because hitchhiking back in that day was just as unpredictable as it is now, but most likely was a little more widely accepted mode of transportation. It was a quick trip. Lester was an epileptic and left behind two containers of prescription drugs that she took regularly. So right there making mention that Christine had actually left her medication behind. Now Lester grabbed a ride in her uncle's pickup for the two mile journey to Arizona 77 across a bumpy dirt road. Then after she got out of the pickup at the paved road, Christine later apparently vanished into thin air, Miller said. Now, because I don't have the beginning of this article, I'm not entirely sure who Miller is. Uh, I'm not sure if it's possibly her uncle or a reporter or even a police officer as well. He added that he and the Navajo officers searched the area for miles in all directions to see if she had had a seizure or wandered off, but came up with no leads. So I'm not entirely sure who Miller is, but it does look like they had done some kind of preliminary search for Christine, but like it said in the article that they came up with no leads at all. The woman whom Lester said that she was supposed to meet told investigators later that she had no knowledge of such plans. She also said that she had not spoken with Lester before the woman disappeared. It's a little bit of a nitpicky thing that I was reading when it came to this case. I really wanted to know who, what her relationship to Lester 
was because it's hard to distinguish whether she's meaning that she's never talked to her before at all, period, or just before that day. But like I said, it's kind of a nitpicky thing. It would be easy to jump to conclusions, Miller said, such as that Lester was picked up by someone who killed her after determining that she had money. Now it looks like we're going into speculation and theory mode, which could have been a possibility that that she may have run into somebody that knew she had money, because we all know that violence toward indigenous women is a statistic that seems to always be climbing, not just with every passing year, but with every discovery from cases in the past as well. The article goes on to say that the plot thickens. Miller and the Navajo police have received numerous reports of the woman having been seen from Tuba City, where she went to high school to Winslow to Gallup, New Mexico, during the past four months. So clearly, this Miller person could be a private investigator or a reporter, but here they're citing that she has been seen, and I don't know what information the family has gotten, if any, about all of these rumors, but it continues right here. The most intriguing of those sightings, Miller said, was at a peyote ceremony in the Chuska Mountains 10 miles west of Window Rock two weeks after her disappearance. But it's interesting that she was spotted two weeks after her disappearance because coming from the indigenous community, people tend to know people. And if they don't know you, you know this look. As an indigenous person, you know this look that you get when somebody's trying to figure out who you are. They stare at you. They're studying you. And... It's not really clear how much attention was brought to Christine's case when she first went missing because I don't have any of that information on hand as well. Quote, we had three or four independent accounts of people who said she was there, Miller said, and we found out later from her parents that she had gone to ceremonies in in that area in the past. So again, going back to the peyote sightings, she had had history of being there and that people recognized her. My question is, is that did anybody call her parents, her grandparents, her family and said, hey, look, we've seen her here or at least tried to kind of keep her there while they got a hold of the family. Now, Miller said that the woman was positively identified by the owner of the trailer near the ceremonial site as having stayed in the trailer at the end of the peyote rites. So again, she's being witnessed right here in these ceremonies by people that know her, but for some reason she's eluding detection or that she's or that nobody's trying to bring her home which i think is really odd now the article finishes up with marjorie lester a teacher at indian wells preschool and christine lester's sister-in-law said the family still is baffled by the disappearance she described christine as a shy religious woman who hardly left home and definitely had no place to go quote she never had any problems with anyone marjorie lester said except for a few fights with her brothers They always thought that she would have herded more sheep than she did. So I can't speculate too much on that because I don't really know what that, what they're referring to when it comes to the sheep, but it seems like her entire family is confused where she would have gone or why she would have even left. And with all of these accounts of people seeing Christine and people recognizing her, there's not too much information that I can go off of or even why it's taken 35 years with zero answers. And it just baffles me. But according to the NamUs and the Charlie Project, at the time of her disappearance, Christine would have actually been around five foot three to five foot four, at around 120 to 125 pounds. Now, Christine, at the time that she disappeared, she had brown eyes and brown hair. And the only article of clothing that has ever been mentioned was of a silver bracelet with turquoise inlay that said Christine. But that seems to be all the answers. That's all the information that is out there about this case. If you know any family or know anybody that knows more information on this, I would love to sit down and talk with them. I would love to interview them to know because, like I said, this case fills me with way more questions. It's almost like a cliffhanger of Christine's life, and I'm here for it. I'm waiting for the sequel. Now, if you have any information regarding the disappearance or whereabouts of Christine Lester, I encourage you all to contact the Navajo Nation Police Department at 928 657 3276. Case number 01 87 007 287. With COVID 19 cases declining to low levels across Indian country, it feels like the pandemic is now behind us. However, COVID 19 is still spreading in our communities and new variants are still emerging that could spread more quickly or cause more severe illness. Many states have begun to end mask mandates and other COVID 19 prevention measures. 
but we recognize that the pandemic is still impacting communities across Indian country. As we move forward, it is important that we continue to protect those that are precious to us by following local guidance and being respectful of those around us. With tribal sovereignty and local differences in COVID spread, some communities may have different rules depending on their needs. So check with your local tribal government or local health care provider to learn more about guidance for your community and do what feels safe and comfortable to protect you and your family in situations where guidance has become more relaxed. All right, everybody, welcome back to the second episode of the day. And like I said at the top of the show, this case, just like Christine's, is a case filled with questions and questions and even more questions. And again, just like Christine's, there's a very limited amount of information out there on this case. This case is so unknown to me that I can't imagine how unknown it is to the public because there's not a lot of coverage, because there's zero detail outside of the incident that had happened. So much so, I can't even really remember how I stumbled upon this case. But as we go through this, I will do my best to try to tell as much of the information as I have gathered while researching this. So with that being said, let's talk about the unsolved homicide of Lena Scott. Now, in the early morning of March 21st, 1998, in Tulsa, Oklahoma, at around 1.50 a.m. in the morning, 25-year-old Lena Scott was involved in an argument in the 6300 block of South Peora Avenue, just outside of the parking lot of a local bar called The Zone. Now, according to witnesses, Scott was actually arguing with 27-year-old Antonio Vacante Gonzalez, who was actually Lena's boyfriend at the time. Gonzalez was actually sitting in his truck while Lena was outside of the truck. Now, while Gonzalez was sitting in the truck, Lena was actually outside of the truck. When Gonzalez actually backed up the truck and struck Lena, which knocked her down, while taking off from the scene, Gonzalez's truck actually caught Lena and dragged her about 100 yards into Peora Avenue. More unfortunately for Lena, as they pulled onto Peora Avenue, she would be met by a 1987 Buick LeSabre heading northbound, which struck and ultimately killed her. Now, the man that was driving the Buick was later arrested for driving under the influence, or DUI, and, and sadly, that seems to be where the justice for Lena just seems to stop. Now, one thing that was hard to really track down when it comes to Lena, there's not a lot of information about things like where she's originally from, her tribal, her tribal status, or even what tribe that she may be enrolled in or descendant from. The one piece of information that I did get was that she was actually pregnant at the time, but again, does not say how far along she was pregnant. Now, the police later put out an arrest warrant for Gonzalez, charging him with the murder involving the hit and run. From reports from the police, Gonzalez fled the country to avoid the charges right after the incident. And according to an article written by the Tulsa World News on June 29th of 2000 in an article titled, murder suspect seen back in the city, along with recounting the incident that led to Lena's death, reported that police had actually gotten reports that Gonzalez was spotted back in Tulsa in the 2400 block of North Norwood Avenue, according to Officer Lucky Lemons. Along with the sighting, the article goes on to describe Gonzalez's details. He's described to be Hispanic, standing about 5 foot 8 inches tall, about 140 pounds with brown hair and brown eyes. Since then, not much has actually been talked about when it comes to this case. Lena's case was actually featured on a deck of cold case playing cards distributed to inmates in Oklahoma by the Oklahoma State Bureau of Investigation. Now, the cards actually refer to Lena's death as an accident rather than an act. One of the things that I didn't find was any connection or any family that was connected to Lena. You can usually find on Facebook pages where this is actually where I found the playing card you can actually find someone that knows or family members that relate to the victim or the missing. But I haven't been able to find anybody. I haven't been able to find friends, family, anybody that knows. I mean, I get that this is almost 25 years old, 24 this year. But I know somebody out there has to know something. Somebody out there is missing Lena and possibly the unborn child that she would have had. Another place that I was actually able to find more information about Gonzalez was actually on an America's Most Wanted fans thread that mentioned uh, Gonzalez and some of the theories that they had about him was that he might have actually ran off to Mexico to avoid the charges, but it's never specified. It's not even really clear if this is a federal case due to Lena's indigenous status, but that is a question that has risen for me 
in regards to Lena, in regards to this case. But like I said, this is a case that has very little detail and not a lot of clout around it or any sort of support that I can see outside of the OSBI. But I welcome anybody that has any information about where to find Gonzalez and anybody that has any information about it. I strongly urge you to call the Crime Stoppers at 596 COPS. The Citizens Crime Commission actually pays rewards for information leading to the arrest of people who have committed felonies. And keep in mind, you can remain anonymous. Callers that speak Spanish, they also offer a hotline for citizens that speak Spanish. And the number to that hotline is 596-7000, which is the Hispanic Crime Stoppers line. And that police will return calls. So once again, if you have any information regarding the murder of Lena Scott, you are encouraged to contact the OSBI at one 800 522 8017 because somebody out there knows something somebody knows who this woman is or was and somebody knows where to find gonzalez let's find justice for lena scott thank you everybody for tuning in to this episode of one missing one murdered all indigenous so at the top of the episode i talked about something special that i was going to be doing on may 5th for the missing murdered indigenous women awareness day with MMIW Awareness Day coming right around the corner on May 5th, I'm actually going to be releasing a special episode dedicated to the missing and murdered indigenous women movement. Come join me as we explore the tragic case of Rosinda Strong, a beautiful indigenous woman whose life was actually cut tragically short. And to help tell her story, joining me will be Rosinda's sister, Sissy Reyes. So please come sit down with me as we go through the untold story of Rosinda's journey home from Sissy's point of view. And I want to thank all of my true Indigenous crime listeners as we continue down this journey with all of you as we carry onward for all of our lost, stolen brothers, sisters, mothers, fathers, sons, daughters, aunties, uncles, cousins, and grandparents. Also, don't forget to check out our sponsor, TwistedBearBoutique.com and check out some of the amazing Mother's Day specials that we've got going on. And hopefully you find something for that special mama bear in your life. And when going to check out just use code Mama Bear. that's all capital M-A-M-A-B-E-A-R, for 20% discount on your first purchase. That's TwistedBearBoutique.com. Also, don't forget that the paranormal podcast that I started, Scary Stories to Tell, from the Res, will be releasing a brand new episode every Saturday for Scary Res Story Saturdays. But with that being said, everybody, I want to say thank you again to everybody that's tuning in. And please, if you love what you hear, don't forget to like, share, subscribe, and help me continue bringing light to cases and bringing voices to the voiceless. May the Creator bless you all as you go on in a good way. Thank you all. Stay safe. All recording and editing is done by me, Jordan Lombear. Music brought to us by Rainisa Ridley. One Missing, One Murdered, All Indigenous is a Lombear production. <laughs>